Good to go. Well, good morning, Queensland. And can I welcome back the Premier for my very successful trip uh, to Tokyo, uh, of course, securing the Brisbane Olympics for 2032. And it was great to have the Premier chairing our COVID briefing this morning, although she has to do it from hotel quarantine. I can report uh, one new community case this morning. Uh, this case is a gentleman in his 40s who has travelled uh, from China. Uh, he completed his full hotel quarantine period and tested negative on his exit test. He has now tested positive. Uh, he is fully vaccinated. Uh, his immediate household members are now in quarantine and have also been tested and uh, I'm pleased to say have so far tested negative. We are awaiting the genomic sequencing for this gentleman so we can see if there is any links to any other cases in Queensland or Australia. And Dr Young will update us a bit more on uh, this particular gentleman. There's 26 active cases now. That brings us to 1,770 total cases in Queensland. Uh, we've had 10,811 tests overnight and 3,492 vaccinations in the last 24 hours. And I can advise we're now at 2,134 people in home quarantine. So again, I thank all of those people who are complying with their directives to isolate themselves at home because they are close contacts. I remind them if they need any assistance whatsoever, they can ring 134 COVID. Uh, and of course, their actions mean uh, that we can avoid transmission uh, in the community by them staying home and complying with their quarantine period. Now, because of this gentleman, and of course, the other two individuals, the flight attendant and the gentleman who traveled from New South Wales, uh, the index case uh, for the flight attendant, we do have new exposure sites going up regularly. So I encourage anyone who either lives or has travelled uh, around Brisbane or the Gold Coast in the past couple of weeks to be regularly checking the Queensland COVID websites for exposure sites. So if you've been to any of those exposure sites, you must uh, quarantine. Uh, get tested and contact Queensland Health and follow further advice. Of course, if you've been anywhere in Queensland and you have any symptoms whatsoever, we encourage you to come forward and get tested and isolate until you have your results. I remind all Queenslanders who uh, live in the 11 LGAs in South East Queensland, mandatory masks are still required. Uh, and please, everyone, follow uh, the social distancing, good hand hygiene and staying home when you're unwell and getting tested. I also want to give a shout out to Ariane Titmus, who uh, this morning at 11.20 will be competing in the 400 metre freestyle. I know she's in with a very good chance of winning gold and we wish her all the best and to all of the Olympians, uh, particularly those from Queensland, but of course all Australian Olympians who are over in Tokyo right now competing. We wish them all the best going forward. And I also want to mention that at the start of August, we will be opening a new uh, community vaccination hub in Townsville. This will be the first community-based vaccination centre uh, in Townsville, and it's in preparation for our increasing number of vaccines. So we will be getting um, more in August, but of course, we are still waiting for that large amount of vaccine to come in October, where we can uh, open it up to the broader general population and see as many Queenslanders who are wanting and willing to get vaccinated to come forward and get vaccinated as quickly as possible. And I remind anyone who is 60 and above uh, that there is uh, sufficient stocks of AstraZeneca throughout Queensland that you can go see a GP, uh, Commonwealth vaccination clinics uh, or pharmacies in the regions that are making it available to get vaccinated. And we strongly encourage you to do that. And of course, anyone who already has a booking with us or is eligible for their second dose of Pfizer, uh, please, if you have not been able to secure a booking, contact 134 COVID to make sure you get your second vaccination on time. I'll hand now to Dr Young uh, and then the Deputy Commissioner uh, for an update. Thank you, Minister.
So one new case in Queensland. I'm not sure of the acquisition of this case. It could have been in China, it could have been in hotel quarantine, or indeed it could have been in the community down in the Gold Coast. So this is an individual who returned from China, spent two weeks in hotel quarantine, had three negative tests, then was released from hotel quarantine in Brisbane, went, returned home to the Gold Coast on the 12th of July, then um, became, he and his family became unwell on the 13th of July, so they went and saw their GP and got tested, and we got that first test result back yesterday, but it was a very, very high CT value, so not a lot of virus. So we were just trying to work through what exactly that meant. We got a second test done, and that's come back at a moderate level of um, a CT value, which means there's a reasonable amount of virus. So that means he's, now, he's definitely at the acute stage of a new infection. So we'll just work through what that means. So we've already spoken to him, of course, and um, worked out where he's been out in the community and we've put all of those exposure sites up on our website so there's quite a number of those for people to be aware of. So please, anyone who's been in the Gold Coast or in Brisbane since the 13th of July, please look at our website and check and see if you've been to any of those exposure sites. If you have, follow the instructions on the website or ring 134 COVID and we'll assist you to work through what that means. That's very important as we go forward. Thank you to those more than 10,000 people in Queensland who've come forward in the last 24 hours to be tested. That's fantastic. That's a very, very good result. Please keep coming forward, any symptoms at all, anywhere in Queensland, because we don't know where this virus might pop up. It's really important that you come forward and get tested as soon as possible so we can work out if we've got any other chains of transmission happening in our state. Thank you. Um, morning. Um, we are at an um, elevated operational level at the moment. I am. Um, able to tell you that yesterday we intercepted 2,600 vehicles at our road borders and uh, refused entry to 48 vehicles and uh, four persons were placed into hotel quarantine. Uh, the numbers arriving at our domestic air borders have dropped away, so 510 persons processed yesterday, five um, refused entry and 141 placed into hotel quarantine. We saw um, 77 international arrivals. So with the reduction of the cap to 650, we've seen those numbers drop down as well. Uh, we did hand out 21 masks, so the message is there. The masks are still with us for a little while yet, so please do make sure you carry your mask and wear them where you should. Uh, we only had to take uh, two pieces of enforcement action, and they related to a person coming across the Texas um, entry with a false declaration and a heavy vehicle also in the Darling Downs area that had a false declaration. Um, on our heavy vehicles, we intercepted 537 yesterday, um, 12 did not have the appropriate um, uh, paperwork and three were refused entry. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. Well, his first test had a very, very high CT value, which means there was very little virus there. So little virus that we couldn't even do genome sequencing on it. So that suggests that he was very, very early in his disease or very late in his disease, or it was persistent shedding. That's why we did further testing, but his second test, while he's been in quarantine, we immediately put him in quarantine or isolation after his first test. His second test has come back with a higher amount of virus. That means he's entering his disease, if that makes sense. So he's early on and he's um, progressing. So it should, it should be low risk. But look, we don't know. He's fully vaccinated and we still don't fully understand what that means in terms of the time it takes to become infectious and what it does about um, the viral load. So there's so many unknowns here. So we're taking a very cautious approach, of course, as we always do, and asking that people who've been to any of those sites um, contact us so we can talk to them.
Yeah, so it's, it's the drop-off time that was the risk. It's not during the day when the children were there because they've all tested negative, it's the drop-off and the collection time. Well, we're not sure of that. So we know he tested negative on his exit test, but he became unwell on the 13th, so he left hotel quarantine on the 12th and then became unwell on the 13th. But that could be a totally unrelated illness. I mean, my thinking when I was first given these results was that we know if you have a separate illness, a separate respiratory illness, that can lead to shedding of COVID-19 virus if you've previously been infected. That's why we had to wait for more test results. So we're picking that 13th as the potential start of his infectious period, but in actual fact, it might have been later, but we're going with the most cautious. Uh, between the gentleman from China. I, I don't know the relationship. So um, the, the airline um, flight crew member drove down to Ballina to pick him up, but I don't know what their relationship is. Um, I've still got to see what's going on out in the community. It's too early to say that we won't get cases. We need to wait and see. Yep, so um, as Dr Young has said previously, our focus at the moment is trying to contact trace these two people. We know they are associates. Um, and obviously know each other. Um, we are focusing on who they have had contact tracing with, so the work we've been doing over the preceding days is to be get as much information out of those people as we possibly can. We had to go um, through a formal process to give directed interview for the um, flight attendant so we could get that information. Um, uh, so we have undertaken that. We are now doing that with the male person. Not fully, not initially, no, she wasn't. So, uh, but there are processes that we're able to implement to get that information, we now have it. Um, yeah, and of course some of that information has not been correct and that's been proven through the contact tracing, we're doing that, it's not correct. So we'll continue to work through that. Also there are potential offences committed by both in relation to breaches of the Chief Health Officer's directions, which we are investigating. And also we are working with our New, so New South Wales colleagues in terms of what has happened in New South Wales, particularly by the male, but by both um, when she was picked up. So, sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, um, uh, certainly the uh, female person has had legal representation. Sorry, Lane, I can't hear for the helicopter. Look, um, I'm not going to comment any any um, other information that we have hold. I can tell you um, very clearly that the only things that we're investigating at the moment are breaches of health directions. Ah, oh, that'll depend on how much evidence we secure, and that's the focus at the moment is the contact tracing and working away where they've been and trying to identify anyone that's been exposed. Absolutely. Uh, the border breaches carry a $4,135 fine. Um, that's if you get a penalty infringement notice. Of course, if you put before the court, that can be higher. Um, and for any other breaches uh, um, within the state for not following the directions, it's um, $1,378. Um, I don't believe we have a fine for lying for the police, unfortunately, so um, obviously we will look at all of the um, actions in relation to this. I just say the focus at the moment is trying to identify who's been exposed to these people. And I, we, we do what we always do in our investigations, we're very thorough. Beg your pardon? Uh, no, that hasn't been concluded, that investigation. That's it. They're still in the quarantine. Yeah. So. Yep, sure.
oh look, it would be completely inappropriate for me to uh, stand here and try to uh, determine what someone's death related to. I am not a medical professional. Uh, where these reportable deaths occur, uh, they were referred off to the relevant authorities, including the coroner. Uh, so I'm aware of uh, a number of cases, I think five that uh, have been provided to uh, the media that show that two have been referred to the coroner. Uh, another three have been investigated internally and seen that no further action has been taken. So uh, of those matters that have been uh, provided to the media, there is not one of those cases where there has been a finding made that they directly relate to uh, any delay in ambulance arrivals that led to their death. Oh, we all have to do everything we can to provide the best service in the most timely way possible. Uh, but there will always be times where there is extra demand on our services and our, our paramedics do an incredible job in prioritising uh, the time in which they dis uh, dispatch ambulances. They're not decided by the minister, they're decided by uh, those individuals sitting at the other end of those calls to prioritise it, does this need an ambulance immediately dispatched? And I know in some of the examples we've provided uh, to yourself, uh, you'll see that ambulances were reprioritised uh, to other jobs that were seen as more serious. So that is the call of the paramedics to make those decisions. Uh, they are best placed to identify that. Uh, it is very sad when anyone's life um, you know, is lost and I don't think we can stand here and make uh, assumptions as to the reason why. There's a whole lot of factors. Uh, but sometimes, sadly, people pass away before an ambulance arrives uh, and sometimes they pass away after an ambulance has uh, delivered them to the hospital. And that can be for a whole range of reasons. Uh, what I know from the information that's been provided is there is no findings in relation to those five cases uh, where uh, the delay in an ambulance has been directly linked to uh, their passing. That's what I'm aware of. Oh, look, that's for Campbell Newman. What uh, I find interesting is it's not the Leader of the Opposition, David Chris, are fully distancing himself from Campbell Newman. It's Campbell Newman distancing himself from uh, the Leader of the Opposition and from the LNP. Uh, look, irrespective of whether Campbell Newman is part of the LNP or not, uh, there are many who served in his government who made the decisions they did, including as a, as a Health Minister. Uh, I'm very uh, alive to the fact that they, they sacked a whole lot of health workers. Uh, when they were in government. They've never apologised for that. There's a whole lot of public servants who, to this day, still feel the consequences of losing their jobs, many of them who had been a long-term public servants. Uh, so putting Lawrence Brigborg as the president of the LNP, who was the former health minister, uh, putting um, and, and having many of those who sit in the shadow cabinet now who were ministers in the Newman government, Campbell, Campbell Newman leaving the party uh, is just one individual. They all have to take collective responsibility for the decisions they've made in the past. Happy birthday, Minister. Sorry. First of all, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> second, um, John Fox in the Australian Today called us to the paper that his um, alleged public man claiming was because um, the Premier had made it clear to him he wanted to be of growing public pressure for her not to attend the ceremony. Is that what you've heard as well? And, you know, if, if that is true, isn't that... It's not what I've heard. Uh, look, the Premier has spoken about this. John Coates has spoken about this. Uh, they've all given their explanation in relation to that press conference. I really don't think there's anything else to add. Uh, look, she was bright and, and cheery uh, this morning, uh, cheering the, the COVID update. Uh, she knows she's got, you know, 13 days more to go uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure she'll keep busy. I have no doubt that she'll have many, much contact with her department and also with ministers across the government over the next 14 days. And hopefully she's going to take a moment to get to watch some of the Olympics because I think it's going to be thrilling today. Oh, look, I, and I've heard these statements and I understand the opposition are, are claiming that she's in a three-bedroom suite. She's one person. 
staying in one of the many rooms uh, that have been set aside for hotel quarantine. So this room has been used by many of other people who have been in hotel quarantine. Uh, I understand there's at least 20 other people who are hotel quarantining on that floor, um, including, I believe, the, the Mayor of Brisbane City Council. There's nothing unique about this arrangement. Uh, they are hotel quarantine rooms. That's not correct, but I might get the Deputy uh, Commissioner just to talk about the arrangements as well. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. So, as you would be aware, the, um, the Premier in particular is a person that's under protection. So, the room that she is in has been selected in consultation with the Queensland Police Service so that we can provide her with appropriate protection. Uh, to that end, I'm not going to get into the details of where she is and where she isn't. Um, that's not really anyone's concern. Unfortunately, we do have to provide dignitary protection to our Premier because of the threats that she sometimes faces, and that's a long-standing arrangement for Premiers going out many years in the state. So um, it has been set up. It is what I would call a modest room, certainly not a three-bedroom suite, which would be a complete inaccuracy. So, um, and of course, it's been set up so she can do a job, including uh, being able to connect into National Cabinet. Um, let's just say the. the we have uh, very secure premises in terms of the hotel overall, but our security people are engaged with that in terms of making sure the Premier is protected. Thank you. I'm not going to get into how we do our security, sorry. No. Thank you. Today is Monday and we have masks in place till 6am Friday at this point, so let's see how we go through the next few days. Let me see how we go over the next few days. As I said, today's Monday, Friday 6am is when we'll have a change in our situation. So we'll decide um, closer to then. But thank you to everyone who's wearing masks. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that with these many, many incursions of the virus that we've had over the last two weeks, that masks have helped us enormously. So thank you. Um, I will wait until we get whole genome sequencing results, which will come through late today, and that will then assist in determining how he acquired this infection. We know that these vaccines are not 100 per cent effective against preventing infection, but they're very effective against preventing severe disease and death which is why each of us as individuals, when we're able to, recognising that there is a shortage of the Pfizer vaccine, but each of us, when we're able to, should get ourselves vaccinated. And that's particularly important for anyone who's aged 60 years or older. They should immediately, if they haven't already had a dose of AstraZeneca, go and get a dose of AstraZeneca, unless they're one of those very, very small numbers of people who can't have AstraZeneca. So anyone 60 years of over, age or over, please go and get your first dose of AstraZeneca. Anyone who's already had a dose of either Pfizer or AstraZeneca, it's extremely important you go and get a second dose because we know with the Delta strain that one dose is only around about 30 per cent protective. You need that second dose. So for AstraZeneca, that is ideally at 12 weeks. For Pfizer, that is ideally between three and six weeks after the first dose. Thank you. I do. It wasn't Pfizer or AstraZeneca. It was a um, Chinese vaccine. Yes. Yes, he was vaccinated in China. Yes, I won't get that till I get the whole genome sequencing later today. Well, except I will point out that the vast majority of people in Queensland have totally supported us, worked with us, given us all their private information, and I'm so grateful to them. Yes, there's been a very, very small minority who've not worked with us, and that is disappointing, but it is thrilling to see the number of people who have worked with us brilliantly. Thank you.